All right, we're going to set the intention. This is, I'm so excited to share this. I don't usually share this part, but something saying every, every conversation with you, Aaron is so rich. I'm like, let's share this. What the heck? <laughs> Why not? Why not? All right. Do you want to, you want to take a crack at it? And I'll add Yeah, it? I'll uh, kick it off and then I'll pass to you. All right. Beautiful. Beautiful. Supreme Spirit, we thank you for this opportunity to commune together and to allow a space for you to fill the gap with your presence, your knowledge, your wisdom, your revelation. And so we thank you today for guiding this conversation according to the laws of love, the law of one, the laws of truth. And we ask that you allow us a greater capacity today to be your instruments, to speak for you, as you, and through you, so that it might not be us and our personal will that comes through, but yours. And we thank you for that guidance, that grace that you give us to do so. And I pass this prayer. Thank you. So beautiful. I'm just going to add, may all hearts, minds, bodies, souls be open and to receive whatever is for the highest good for every single beautiful listener around the globe, around our earth plane and mm -hmm. beyond. And just so honored and grateful to be here with you as each of us as an instrument uh, from this one all loving creator and to speak of the highest vibration of love, of light, of truth, and of joy. Mm -hmm. So it is. And so it is. And so it is. Oh my gosh. Well, all right. USU family, brothers, sisters all over the globe. So honored to be in your earbuds and so excited to be here again with really what feels like my brother from another mother, whether he knows that or not. <laughs> I have loved interviewing, bringing in Aaron Abke, and he is back with us today. I want to share just in case you might be new to this community or you don't know Aaron or his work yet, you, uh, you're just... I'm encouraging you to listen to this conversation with your heart fully opened and your mind just in a, in a calm, peaceful, open state as well. Aaron Apke is a paradigm shifting spiritual teacher who delivers a fresh new perspective on self-realization through his teachings on the law of one, non-duality and spiritual intelligence. Aaron aims to provide humanity with the tools, the knowledge, and practices needed to aid our collective ascension to enlightenment or fourth density consciousness. His passion and purpose are to awaken this planet to the awareness of our oneness and collective destiny as an enlightened civilization. And I just muted myself. I, I saw that. <laughs> Now you can see my friends, why <laughs> I'm so excited and, and, and have loved having Aaron here because really, truly, I feel like we're in a very similar, similar mission, a similar reason for being here. And, um, I, I just can't wait to dive in all of these concepts. Um, I thank you, Aaron, for being back on the USU show today. So grateful to have you. Thank you for having me back, Julie. Uh, is this our, I think in our third conversation? I think it's our third and I feel like I need the disclaimer. Like, you know, I just wait till I get this inspiration and I literally, I've been listening. We'll, we'll talk about the love one and, and that the raw material I, I was listening and listening and I'm like, must bring Aaron back. I took notes as I'm, you know, for me often at the gym or walking is when I do, I listen, mm -hmm. I, I kept writing and then like almost fell. I'm like, maybe put down, maybe do this later, but I need to bring Aaron back. We need to have a conversation. <laughs> so, like I'm too into this right now. I'm too into this. So yeah, this is our third, our third time. Awesome. Yeah. I had such a great time in our first two conversations and just love the energy of co-creation that happens. So really, really excited to be back on today. Oh my gosh. Well, I think let's dive in here. I, I, I will just say I have a lot of different things that I would love for us to cover. And we're just going to start to me for those who are joining and what I have noticed um, just in responses and feedback and comments is we have a lot of just incredible, highly intelligent, highly sensitive, empathic, awakening individuals and souls here. And so I just want to honor our community, the community that's listening and tuning in, because I know anybody who's here right now 
in my heart is here because they want to actualize their gifts, their highest potential, and they want to return to a sense of peace, of unity, of connectedness. And so this conversation is for anyone who's who's resonating with that. Um, and, you know, I remember we had spoken and we'll probably come back to A Course in Miracles at some point in this convo. We also talked about the raw material, the law of one, and this is quite a dense material of um, works is. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think maybe to just start with level setting a little bit about this channeled work and, um, and then just getting into some of the basic principles of the law of one. And I have some thoughts on that, but I would love to hear, like, maybe you can kick it off and just get us started. Yeah. <laughs> get the ball rolling. Get the ball rolling. So if you, if you're not familiar with the raw material, it's a channeled text from the early 1980s. And it's a, it was a group of UFO researchers who were trying to figure out what the UFO phenomenon was all about. Back in the 70s, 80s, there was a lot of UFO activity. And so this group of researchers had this brilliant idea that, you know, if we want to understand who these beings are that are appearing in our skies, we should probably be more interested in their philosophy and in their spirituality than in their technology. Everyone's like, how are they flying like that? You know, that's not actually really going to help us know them in a sense. So they started channeling as a means to contact these entities. And it was, I think, like better part of 12 years that this ongoing effort was happening until eventually they found a, uh, a very gifted channeler, a woman named Carla, a young woman who was, uh, whose boyfriend was in the channeling group. And he brought her to one of the sessions and she was like, wow, this is amazing. And as is just uncanny seems to be true across the board. Women are just better channelers than men. <laughs> and she picked it up like that and um, started channeling. And then one day she was actually in a teaching session, teaching a student how to channel. And this contact came through, which identified itself as Ra. And Dawn, who was the head of that group, was listening in and was going, oh my goodness, this is like a, a genuine contact. We have to set aside, a, we have to create a space for this contact. So they started doing uh, what they called the raw sessions where they sat down with Carla. She would get into a trance, lay down under a blanket, blindfold, go into a deep trance. And then Dawn would be the questioner questioning raw. And then Jim McCarty was the scribe documenting the conversation. And then off went 106 sessions over a four year period where they just asked this um, sixth density social memory complex named Ra, which I'll, I'll tell you what that means in a second. <laughs> and they basically just ask this entity about the nature of the universe in a question answer format. One of the big things in the raw material that comes through very strongly is this, uh, sh this strong protection of free will that they did not want to infringe on free will. And so they said, Hey, unlike a lot of channeled texts that we're familiar with, where it's just a, an entity sort of just stream of consciousness teaching us about truth in the universe. Ra says, we don't want to tell you anything that you're not ready to know or that you don't want to know. So you just ask us whatever questions you have, and we will do our best to serve you by answering, unless we believe that giving you the answer would be a bit of an infringement on your free will. And in, in many cases, you know, they'll ask Ra a certain question and Ra will say, no, we can't tell you that information. So they get into the, really, it sort of lays out the metaphysics of the universe, why the universe was created, what purpose is it serving? Uh, to me, Julie, the law of one has a way, unlike any other channel text, to really give some incredibly satisfying answers for like, hey, why are we here? Why am I in a human body? And is there a greater purpose to all of this? Where do I go after I die? And why do I go somewhere after I die? You know, all these esoteric existential questions become answered in the most brilliant way in the law of one in such a way that when people hear it, the, the common feedback I see everywhere is, wow, it's like part of me always knew this or already knew this somewhere. And I'm just remembering this information for the first time. Very like amazing job right now, just distilling. Cause that I was like, how is he going to tell us what, what this? I've had a lot of practice, Julie. <laughs> I know you do. And I know you have a ton of videos and I'm going to recommend everybody go to check you out. You have so many great 
so many great uh, videos and, and, and information on this. Mm -hmm. I think um, I definitely do want to look at the sixth density social memory complex for, for those that are like, what are you talking about? What does that mean? I do want to say something though, because when I was listening, when I listened to this, I, I, I found it easier to listen than to read the book. Um, and I could feel like you said this resonance, this like, Oh, this feels really, really aligned in a way that take out doctrine, religion, just anything else. And it was like, it felt like from my crown to my, my toes was this, just this point of, um, just a, it felt like a clear crystal of like, yep, that felt right. Resonance. Resonance. That's the word. Yeah. Yeah. That's the word. Um, and I will ask you, do you want to talk about, cause they talk about these, the, the law of free will, the law of confusion, the law of polarities. And I think you did a really beautiful job also explaining, setting the scene that, you know, for those of us, if you're still listening, <laughs> for those of us who are like, what is this all about? Like what's happening? Like what's happening in this planet? What the heck am I here for? What happens? Like what it, it just, it, it, to me, it, and we'll get into that. It was um, such a, it's such a resonance and it felt like, oh, this, it, and maybe we start with the law of one, this unity consciousness, um, the, the whole point is the law of one. Cause that to me, um, for those who are human, anyone listening, I mean, unless your dog's listening, you know, we, well, I don't want to give it all away, but I mean, you know, we came here as we think we're separate and that's the illusion. So let's, yeah. let's get into the law of one and, and maybe right before you can do the sixth memory, just kind of explain what the sixth density social memory complex means. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. So the law of one is very simple. It just says that the whole universe is one being, I think Ra actually says the universe is one being yeah. uh, Ra also says all of creation is a part of one original thought. They call it the logos. Um, so the idea is that, you know, we're all like, there's different ways we can look at this. I like to see it as, you know, if the universe is like the nervous system of God or something, mm -hmm. we're like, each one of us is like an individual neuron in the divine nervous system or an individual brain cell in the divine mind in that we all have a function and play a part in the, the totality knowing itself and being itself. So that is what we call reincarnation and spiritual evolution, that we are all little fractals of the one infinite creator that um, I like to give, I gave this analogy in one video that works for me at least of a mirror. And if you shatter that mirror and you see all the fragments of glass going out like this, each one of us is like one of those little fragments of, of glass from that mirror that go out into space time and seem to be a separate piece, an individual piece. And then at a certain point, uh, which is the first density of consciousness, this return movement starts where all these pieces start working their way back to the creator again, and then bring that mirror back into its full original unity. So this is where we get into the seven densities of consciousness that Ra explains as kind of the blueprint for the soul of how the soul evolves through space and time through millions of lifetimes. And the, the densities correlate to the chakras or the seven energy centers. So if you understand the chakras, you have a huge leg up in understanding the densities. The first density is correlates to the root chakra, which is the red ray energy center. And it's the density of pure being. So consciousness, when it begins this journey through space and time, it has to begin from the first point of creation, which is, uh, we know is the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. The whole universe is those five elements in different varieties. So consciousness spends, you know, billions of years just existing in space as, um, you know, gas and dust and, and stars begin to form. And we know the science of that. And then eventually planets form around the stars and begin their orbits. And then on those planets, you know, the, the earth, the magma, the water is interacting for billions of years until the planet solidifies and then oceans form. And then eventually some kind of, you know, microbial life will form in the ocean. 
And that's the beginning of the second density of consciousness, where now consciousness has gained enough experience existing in time space that it can start to become a bit more autonomous. And so the second density correlates to the second chakra, the orange ray. And it's the density of like growth and movement. So anything that can move around and interact with its environment is a second density life form. <clears throat> and that would span from microbial life through plants, insects, fish, animals, and like the latest stage of second density would be like a pet, like a dog or a cat. And the reason that's the latest stage is because after, you know, a few more billion years in second density, consciousness has gained enough experience as, you know, interacting with its environment and stuff that then this really amazing thing happens where consciousness kind of flips in on itself and becomes an object to itself. And that's where the I am knowledge is born and consciousness becomes what we call self-aware where now consciousness isn't just existing as an individual in time and space, but now it knows that it's existing as an individual in time and space. And so with that conceptual knowing I exist, I am, come a whole host of pretty intense consequences. And so the third density correlates to the solar plexus chakra, the yellow ray. So that's the density we are in right now and slowly, gradually moving out of or graduating from. But basically, once consciousness realizes it's an individual separate being, then everything becomes sort of a threat to its survival. Mm -hmm. And so third density, we could also call it the density of separation, where everything and everyone is seen as a potential obstacle or enemy or threat or something to be conquered, something to be possessed and controlled. And so that's why we see a lot of warfare and strife and, and genocide and just horrible atrocities happening in third density because consciousness has not yet learned that it is one with the whole. It thinks it's separate. So after um, the law of one says that third density, because it's so intense and so full of catalyst, it only lasts for about 75,000 years which compared to 2 billion, 4 billion years is nothing. It's a snap of a finger. And that's because the creator is very merciful and doesn't want to keep consciousness in this plane of suffering and, and turmoil for too long. So, you know, thanks creator. But we, we have a very important choice point here in third density. And this is where the law of one begins to get, if you weren't already interested, this is where it gets really, really interesting to me. And that the law of one says that just like any quantum particle, just like basic chemistry, everything in the universe we know through science is electromagnetic energy. Our body is just electromagnetic energy. Everything we see with form is that. And so just like in chemistry, every particle has to have a charge, positive or negative, electrons are negative, protons are positive, et cetera. Ra says, you're just like that. Your consciousness is exactly like that in that you have to choose which polarity you want to be. And uh, just like in chemistry, there's a term called work. Uh, to perform work means a particle's ability to interact with and cause changes in its environment. So until a particle has a charge, it can't really do anything. So we're trying right now in this third density plane to gain a charge, positive or negative. And so the question is, well, how do I do that? How do I choose that charge? And we could, we could distill it down simply to love or separation, love or fear. If you choose the path of love, you have to fully commit to that path and become a being of love where you are, your, your primary operating mode becomes what Ra calls service to others. Meaning you're not so selfish anymore and so self-seeking where you think you're the most important being in the universe and that your needs matter more than everyone else's, but you've transcended that pride and arrogance and you realize, no, all is equally valid. All is equally the creator. And so I should love and serve everything as if it's the creator. And once we start to spiritually intuitively grasp that we are gaining a positive charge. And eventually if we continue down that path of love and service and spiritual growth, um, we'll have another amazing phenomenon happen, which we have classically called Kundalini awakening. 
And whether this happens like the lightning bolt experience we're familiar with, or whether it happens kind of silently and gradually within your nervous system, polarizing positively calls this energy into activation to begin upgrading your nervous system. And it's, it's called green ray energy, which is the energy of the heart chakra. And so that takes us to the fourth density. And just to close the loop on the negative, if anyone's wondering, you also have to choose the negative by essentially cutting your heart off from all of creation to where you feel no love, you feel no unity with anything. Um, you, could, you could murder someone and feel absolutely nothing. In fact, that's one of the initiation rituals of the negative path. And uh, you become all about yourself, where my entire existence is solely dependent on enslaving others and taking power over others. So I like to summarize the positive and negative, Julie, as the difference between a star and a black hole. <clears throat> a star is radiating, right? It's outward shining. It's always giving off light and giving light to everything equally in all directions. So the, the positive polarity in consciousness has an endless supply of power because it's connected to the oneness of the universe. So it's drawing upon all power in the universe. But the negative polarity is like a black hole in that it is completely separate and has an endless need for power. So it's constantly absorbing, uh, drawing into itself forever, and it can never be satisfied. It can never have enough power. All it ever wants is more power, no matter what because it's, it's empty, it's separate, it has no power in and of itself. So those, those, that's an easy way to understand the basic nature of the polarities. But from there, um, we move up the, the densities and to graduate to fourth density, positive or negative, requires you to choose that polarity here in third density. So the answer is, if you wanna escape the wheel of samsara, the law of one says you gotta choose which path you want and fully commit to that path. We get stuck in this third density plane because we're in this rub between positive and negative, and we can't quite choose. And we're flipping and flopping back and forth for lifetime after lifetime, a little bit loving, and then a little bit selfish, and then a little bit service, and then a little bit greed. And Ra says, your soul can do that for millions of years if you want, but you, you're not eligible to graduate to that fourth density level where things become very harmonious and wonderful until you've chosen your polarity here in third density. Okay, <laughs> so just take a breath. Everyone with me, take a breath. There's so much here. I'm gonna just take a moment because I have lots and lots of questions and thoughts. Um, so let me ask you this as a human, someone who's listening, who is becoming more aware and seeing, oh, you know what? I wanna change. I wanna stop being judgmental. I wanna, I wanna stop, you know, see the world more from the eyes. I'm just going to go on a limb and I'm going to guess anyone that's listening, I'm going to guess is looking to be more like the star to radiate, to right. reveal, to reveal light, to shine light. I just, I am thinking I typically attract <laughs> <laughs> not a that stretch type. at all. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, that's definitely what I'm here for. I mean, I feel like you gave me, if the universe gave me a Jersey, it would say like, you know, you know, going for the fourth like, team <laughs> service to others. Yeah. Team service with a big star. Like that's what we're doing here. So, um, for somebody who's like, yeah, I don't want to keep in this loop. I would like to move on to the fourth density positive. Um, and you know, it, it, it takes something to, I mean, you know, this, it takes something to really heal. I'm going to use the word heal your mind. I don't know if that's the mm -hmm. right one, but it's the word coming through me because in doing my own work on this, there's so much programming, there's so much upside down illusions, there's so much that we are indoctrined with that it's a, it's a healing. And so maybe we pause for a minute and talk about how do you heal your mind to be, the way I think of it is how do, you know, I'm asking myself, how can I saturate my mind in greater peace? And I call it all, all loving light, right? This, this, this all loving creator. Um, and, you know, being on alert when I'm judging, when I'm not forgiving, all of those things. So for those that are like, yeah, I'd really like to move to fourth density and I'd like to be on that team. Um, what are some thoughts that you have about, you know, I know we're taking a quick pause, but healing the mind, I think is just, I mean, this is it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Very important question. This is really what the whole law of one is about. And 
you know, they'll ask a lot of times they ask Ra questions about science and metaphysics and Ra will sometimes stress like, we'll tell you the answer, but uh, this information to us is essentially not that important. We're really here to teach you the, the law of one and how to polarize and graduate spiritually. Um, and so the, the way that they explain that is now that we understand the positive and negative polarity, then we can understand that every thought you have is going to be polarized one way or the other, positive or negative. And so we could say that any thought or motive that you, that you have that is based in service to self, meaning, oh, this, this is going to benefit me at the cost of someone else, or it's going to benefit me and not help others. That's a negatively polarized thought. So healing the mind is essentially just gradually ridding the mind of all the negatively polarized aspects of our energy, of our thoughts. And so we do that primarily through service to others is the most powerful way, meaning just get beyond yourself in whatever way possible and begin to love and serve others. Actions in time and space carry the most potent force to them. They have the most charge, we could say. Thoughts have the the least powerful amount of charge, uh, let's say creative potential. Feelings have the second most creative potential, but actions have the most creative potential. Because by the time you're acting on something, you don't act out something you don't believe deeply, that you don't want, that you don't desire or believe in. So your actions in time and space are the truest testament to your state of consciousness. So if your mind is very negative, but you want more than anything to transcend the negativity in your mind, to transcend the ego and become truly loving, the best thing you can do is just start loving people because that carries the most powerful charge and you're going to do the most positive work in your mind by doing that. So like, imagine, you know, you get it, you get an ice cream cone and it's your favorite flavor of ice cream and you really want to eat that ice cream cone, but then you see a little kid a little four-year-old girl or something. And she's like, oh, looking at your ice cream cone and something in your heart is moved in that moment to where you say, as much as I would enjoy eating this ice cream, I'm going to enjoy watching this little girl eat it even more. And so you want to give her the ice cream. And so you, you give it to her, you watch her eat it and you're filled with joy watching this little girl be in joy. So you're, you're now connected to the unity of creation Because A Course in Miracles says that giving and receiving are one. That's one of the laws of one, that everything you give, you also receive. Or we could say you keep for yourself what you give away. Or we could say you activate within yourself what you give away. And this is a beautiful, the most beautiful principle of the positive polarity. This is what I mean when I said, this is what I meant when I said the positive has an endless supply of power. And some people might say, well, I don't feel that powerful. Where's all this power you're talking about? And that's the tricky thing is that we can't see our power. We can't see our light unless we give our light, Mm. right? Because if you're the source of it all, if it all exists within you and infinite potential, well, how could you ever know unless you give it? Like how would a superhero ever know that they had superpowers unless they actually go out to fight crime? Mm. You know, Spider-Man could wake up with amnesia forget who he was. And someone could be like, man, you're the most amazing superhero ever, dude. You shoot spider webs out of your arms and you can fly across buildings. And he's like, uh, okay, whatever you say, he can't really know he is Spider-Man until he goes out to be Mm Spider-Man. So likewise, how can we know our Christ self that we inherently are unless we share and give that Christ self? So that's why it's the service to others polarity, Mm -hmm. because by blessing and loving others, we activate the blessings and the love within ourself And we experience the love that we are by giving it away. So, you know, that's the nature of graduating to fourth density is you got to get into that mode now, because one of the keys raw gives to graduating from density to density is that each density level graduates by learning the lessons in the upcoming density level. So if you're in the third density level, solar plexus chakra, and you're trying to graduate to the heart chakra level, fourth density, Well, what's the fourth density represent? It represents love and unity. So you have to start living here in third density by love and unity. And the good news is you don't have to be 100% polarized to the positive 
before you're eligible to graduate in your next lifetime, Ross says you actually only need to be 51% or greater service to others oriented or polarized. And then you're eligible in, in the universe's eyes, that's you making your choice. So the important thing is it's not enough to just know that I want to be positively polarized. And then when I die, hopefully I'll graduate because you know I want to be positive, right? Are we good here? The universe is like, nope, prove it to me. Put your money where your mouth is. If you really want to be positively polarized, your actions will show it, won't they? You'll want to love others. You'll want to be selfless and giving. And that's how the universe knows you're truly ready for what's next. Mm. Oh my gosh. Can I, can I add a couple of things that are coming through? Because Please I'm do. Like, yeah. This is like, I'm sitting here. I'm like, this is one of my favorite conversations in my entire life. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, uh, just I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with this conversation. And it's so say, good. It's so good. And I do want to say, cause I know some of my listeners for those who have a thing or don't know what this means around the Christ consciousness, we are really referring to that absolute um, divinity potentiality. Yeah. I just wanted to define that because I know for some it can be triggering or they don't have a context. And I think that's right. important. We're just from not even a religion standpoint, we're talking like literally you as a divine being, that pure source energy, source energy, which yeah. I love, you know, what you just said about the 51%, I just had an aha and I'm going to like bring something up. I I recently had a guest called, named Rob Morgan. I don't know if you know him. He's in Sedona. He does these healing activations and he talks about, he was in the movie heal. And he talks about how we have to take 51%. Uh, we have, it, it's on us. It's, our, it's the onus is on us to take 50, at least 51% uh, responsibility. And I was with like 51. And it's so funny, Aaron, I grew up, my street name was fit was number was 51. I've been seeing my whole life. And I'm like, what's up with the 51? And it just connected again, because we have this beautiful free will, the universe, at least my understanding creator is all loving is not judging. However, yeah. is, is interpreting us based on what were the actions. Cause that's, that's the way we show up in this plane. And so it just kind of something went off. I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's that 51%. It totally matches. We have free will. So it's that 1% more on us really in a way, if you kind of boil it down, meaning the creator is here. And yeah, that's a whole other conversation, but it really hit me with this 51%, which is not. So that's really, that's, that's, that's good news. That's not 99%. Yeah. That is 51. I mean, I'm like, yeah, I could do 51. I mean, like that's, I'm hopefully, I'm hopefully close to that, but you know, I've got hopefully a long life. We all got long lives, hopefully to, to do that. Um, you know, I want to ask you because this idea of being loving to others. So it's so resonates, right. And, and I can imagine for those listening, it's like, that is very easy when we're talking about your partner, your children, your pets, people that have been kind to you. I want to look at for a moment, what, how do we do this when mm -hmm. ego hurts judgment? I mean, I want to hear your thoughts. I have thoughts on it, but I want to hear your perspective because I really truly believe this is where we start to heal the mind around separateness is when this can be applied to everybody. And I actually have a question for you in that I've seen, I, I love your work. I often tune in and I'll look at the comments and I just, I'm like, oh, I love these people. And every now and then you get some, you get some, I don't want to call haters, but people that are responding, like, I don't agree or, you know, just, and, and I am always like tuning into you and how you respond because I'm like, I know he's living this. Um, so maybe you can talk real time like on the court, like, mm -hmm. or if you don't mind just sharing how you, how you live this out and what this means, especially yeah, yeah. challenging. Well, a beautiful question. All, all that matters is that we live it. Yeah. You know, knowing it's great. It's a good start, but we don't graduate by what we know. <laughs> we graduate by what we can live. And that becomes challenging. Like you said, when we get beyond the close, intimate relationships, family and friends, Really easy to love those people and be of service. But what about the opposing political party? What about corrupt politicians and the World Economic Forum and people trying to enslave the planet? Can you genuinely love those people and see them as the creator as well? And you know, if 
more than 50% of the people you're, you're looking at every, each and every day, you're feeling this kind of resentment in your heart. The universe is taking note of every single reaction in your consciousness. And it's all the data is going back to source. So there's no fooling the source on how spiritual you are. So this is why I love ACIM, of course, in miracles, because it says forgiveness is the path to heaven. You just have to forgive people. And we don't understand what forgiveness is. From a third density perspective, we think it means to acknowledge the evil in someone and then just somehow overlook that evil and just be okay with that evil. And that's not forgiveness. That's still a judgment. There is no evil in God. And so there's truly none in the world either. But our minds create the illusion of evil when we don't know who God is, when we don't know who we are, when we think we're separate. But the law of one says this, of course, a miracle says this, that separation and evil and all these things, fear, they're just illusions. Illusion is something that depends on something else in order to exist. It's not self-shining. It's not self-sufficient. When you take out what its supply is, you, you kick the legs out from under and it disappears. So what is separation, fear, hatred? What do these things depend on? They depend on the completely delusional belief that something other than God exists. And then not only does something other than God exist, you're that something other than God, right? You're separate from the one source of all existence. I mean, what could be more arrogant and delusional than that? But nevertheless, when we look at something and we don't see the creator in that thing, the mind fills the gap and creates an enemy, a threat, a danger, something to be possessed, something to be controlled. And that's what we call evil, right? The control, the oppression, the enslavement of others. So anyone on our planet right now who's trying to carry out these kind of planetary enslavement uh, attempts we see, it's only because they don't know who God is. They don't know who they are. Uh, and we, we can't and shouldn't judge them as evil for that because number one, how can you possibly know that if you didn't get born into a rich political family who groomed you from childhood to be this political threat one day, that you wouldn't have also taken that lobbying money and said yes to those corrupt business deals. Like You can't possibly know that you wouldn't do the same things in that position. So we just have to look at those people and say with Jesus, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And then once we're willing to forgive what we see as evil, we, we then allow ourselves to actually see the divine light behind the form that our mind was not letting us see before. And that's the beginning of fourth density consciousness. Fourth density consciousness is the awakening to unity, the return to unity where um, I talked about how consciousness has to gain experience in each density before it can go to the next one. Well, basically after so much time in third density of strife and fighting and warfare and violence and suffering, consciousness begins to learn, okay, maybe it's true that we're all existing in these different bodies, but maybe we're all one essence and maybe we all come from the same source and we're all of that same energy. And when consciousness begins to tune into that, it becomes what we call loving. We call that oneness, right? The awareness of oneness is fourth density. And so for me, Julie, the bridge of how I've been able to live this truth out and embody it more each and every day is by contemplating the principle that all things exist in relationship. So if you have a hard time going from separation consciousness to unity consciousness, which can be tough, right? Our mind will fight us big time on that. That can be a hard realization to grasp. So I say, hey, forget about seeing everything as one and seeing the creator and everything. Just recognize that everything exists in relationship. So that's not so hard. Even science tells us that. Everything is depending on everything else in the universe. Nothing can exist in a vacuum. Even, uh, even the sun, which appears to exist in a vacuum, it appears to exist in empty space, but the sun is in relationship to space, right? And then it's also in relationship to the whole galaxy around which it's turning. 
And that galaxy is in relationship to all the other galaxies. So there is nothing in this universe that is separate or can be separate. So separation is an illusion of the mind when consciousness doesn't perceive or comprehend reality yet. It will project an illusion of separation, but you can destroy that illusion by contemplating in every moment, everything exists in relationship. I can do it when I drink my water from my cup and just notice, oh, the cup's holding the water for me to drink. I drink the water. It goes into my body. My body uses it. Eventually, my body excretes it out to the, back to the earth. The earth uses it again. It's all relationship everywhere, giving and receiving, giving and receiving. Mm. And as we begin to contemplate that, that's what allows the, this awareness of oneness to begin really setting in where we go, oh, so if everything is relationship, then really everything's connected. If everything's connected, it's really all one. It's all one. And we just start to notice it naturally. And then once we notice it, it's the effortless and automatic response to seeing oneness Mm -hmm. is love and service to others. It's the highest joy you could possibly conceive of to bless the universe around you. But when you think you're separate, serving others sounds like a drag. You know, it sounds like a burden or something. And it's like, like I always say this, how the ego will hear service to others and go, oh, gag. I got to be worried about other people's happiness too. Oh, I'm too freaking busy with my own happiness. I can't even get happy myself. How am I going to take everyone else's happiness on my shoulders? What a burden. And the paradox, Julie, is that we actually only suffer because we're so obsessed with ourself, right? We're so selfish. We're so greedy. We're so... Um, entitled, and we're not getting beyond ourself. And so service to others, when we get beyond ourself, we realize that what we thought we were as this little isolated entity in the universe, we're actually something so much greater, so much grander, so much more beautiful and amazing. We are the whole universe. We, we depend on the whole universe and the whole universe depends on us. The air I breathe is created by the trees around me. The sunlight on my skin gives my body vitamins to live. If you take away any one of these ingredients, I die immediately. So the trees are my lungs. The sun is my skin. Like um, It's all one. It's all connected. And just try to have that realization and not be full of joy. I dare you. No, oh, that's... <laughs> That, that's such a great, I love that. We're going to put that as a challenge. Let's see. <laughs> Just try to look at the relationships between, yeah, the things exist in relationships and not feel more joy. I love that. That is such a great challenge. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. Challenge accepted. You know, I, um, I know some of my listeners and myself included, um, one of my entree points into shifting a lot of beliefs actually came through the world of 12 steps, 12 step uh, programs, which mm-hmm. I have to say it's super interesting, also channeled work, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. through the founder, Bill W. And similar, if, I don't know how much for you you've done reading in Science of Mind, New Thought. Or yeah, Storms. very mm-hmm. similar. Yes, huge fan. That, that has spoken to me um, also, like all of what we're talking about. And it's interesting, so much of the focus, if for those that have, and I know many, many listeners who've been through 12 steps of different kinds, it's all about being of service. It's all about being the message about yeah getting outside of yourself. And, you know, I remember being like, when the hell am I going to have time to like sponsor and do this and do that? And it's like, you know, it's become a, oh my God, I love being of service. Like that's actually, and you said this, this is where you, everything is in relation to another. It's where you can see the light in you. It's like that word namaste Mm -hmm. in Sanskrit. Yeah. See it reflected the mirror again. And so I just wanted to say that because I've noticed personally speaking, that's, a that's one of the ways I know to, to live this work that a lot of people, um, go that route that often comes through darkness, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a great point, actually, that to live this work, as you said, there's another step that I I teach in my 4D university program. I really drill down on this because 4D university is fourth density university, you know, teaching people how to really integrate and live these fourth density teachings. And, when we understand that all things exist in relationship, then we can take a new view of what enlightenment is or fourth density consciousness. We can say enlightenment is actually just making all relationships loving. Mm. What a simple practice, right? (laughs) What a simple theory. Can I just practice each and every day making every relationship that I'm in a loving relationship? 
that doesn't sound so challenging. And, you know, it, it'll feel challenging at first if your mind's still full of negativity and separation. That's okay. Got to start somewhere. But as you hold this intention, I want to be loving in every relationship that I'm in, my relationship to nature around me. Well, that means I want to stop littering so much. I want to, instead of throwing my bubble gum on the ground, I actually want to walk across the parking lot and put it in that trash can. Why? Because I want to be in a loving relationship with my environment. And I actually feel joyful while I'm walking to the trash can now, right? So we just live this way. And in the simplest things, we try to just be loving in that relationship. And at a certain point, a, um, a critical mass is sort of hit or a snowball effect begins to happen where the momentum of love within you actually takes on its own gravity and inertia. And you find that there's this great force of love within me that's compelling me to be loving now. And where I used to react negatively to things, I'm noticing myself reacting with patience and with kindness and holding space. These things just flower, radiate out of us like the light radiates out of the sun. Once we have understood the true principles of unity and just begin practicing living by them. In my experience, it doesn't actually take very long, you know, one or two years of just holding these intentions in your heart, wanting to live this. And you'll wake up in a few years and ask yourself, hey, when did I stop suffering? And when did I get so happy? You know, it sort of just disappears without a trace on the spiritual path. Mm. I don't know who is not raising their hand saying, um, I want that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> take my money. Yeah. Unless you're psyched about suffering, which I mean, you know, my, my one intention for this new year was just to connect with, with my higher self and the divine. That's it. Like just to, to, to literally everything to go through the process of, you know, I, I like to say like, what would love do here? That's it. What would love do here? So, you know, and, and I'm thinking for those listening that have been in traumatic situations, had trauma, had, had challenges. Mm -hmm. I think what we're not saying is it's not saying if somebody, if there's been abuse, if you've had a, you've experienced mm -hmm. life in a way that has been, um, you know, challenging, upsetting, uh, even, um, what is the word where you feel, um, you know, or trauma, it can be extremely, yeah. um, missing the word, but it, it, it can feel violating. And yeah, it, you know, I was thinking about this before talking to you, um, just that that's a whole long list of what that could be. Um, and sometimes it's ourselves to ourselves, which is tends to be, I know for me, a lot of the trauma is me to myself, which, which is really shitty. Um, and forgiveness, but I think what we're not saying is it's not, it's not saying, oh, that behavior is we're excusing the behavior. It's that point of, if I'm hearing you correctly, and what I believe is that that person is living in the illusion and not realizing who they are. They're not realizing yeah. they, they don't, they, they forgot, they forgot, you know, so just to talk about that for a minute, because I know for some who are, who are healing from trauma, the thing is what we're talking about, I have found to be extremely healing on all levels for all kinds of traumas. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, it's really important when we talk about trauma work and shadow work that to make this distinction, which is that we have to heal on two planes mm -hmm. of who we are, which we can call conveniently our masculine and our feminine. Mm -hmm. We always have to have a balance of masculine and feminine to truly heal something. And I'll explain why the masculine, we could, we could also distill masculine down to mind. And we can distill feminine down to heart. And joining the mind and heart is how we access fourth density consciousness. I call it the I am state. I consciousness am existence. The two are one. So I have to meet both aspects of my being uh, in order to heal them. So we, we heal the masculine aspect of us by correcting our false beliefs Meaning, uh, for example, a trauma, if, you're, if you still suffer from a trauma that happened to you in your past, that's ultimately because you are wrongly identified. It's a wrong identity. And that's why it hurts. Because all suffering is like the universe's cue that you are perceiving yourself in a way that the universe does not perceive you. When you feel like you're unworthy of love, well, that's a really shitty feeling to have because it's not true. And that shitty feeling is actually the universe saying, hey, wrong direction, wrong perception. That's not who you are. That's not true about you. And likewise, when you feel loved, you feel joyful and happy 
because that's the universe saying, ding, ding, ding. That's a correct way to perceive yourself. So we heal our masculine by correcting our false beliefs. And the definition of forgiveness that I give in my uh, ACIM program is forgiveness is simply remembering who you are. Mm, It's not pardoning a wrong that was done to you. It's not making someone's attack against you real and then asking you to please now overlook that attack, which happened to you. It's saying, yes, you experienced what you experienced. You experienced abuse, attack, whatever it was, but it's not fundamentally true of who you are. It was just an experience in the same way that when you dream at night, who among us has ever woken up from a nightmare and had to practice forgiveness for the dream characters that were attacking us? We never do that, right? We just go, phew, glad it didn't happen to me. Phew, glad it wasn't real. So you're, you only suffered in the dream because you were identified with the dream character. Imagine if you brought that identity with you back into the waking state and you're trying to function in your daily life when you're terrified that this three-legged, three-armed, green-eyed monster is chasing you or something, you'd be a lunatic. You would not be able to operate, right? You have to leave that identity in the dream world. And then you're like, oh, no big deal. It didn't happen to what I am. So that's forgiveness, right? We're saying you're wrongly identified with this physical body. Deep in in your mind, you believe that all I am is this physical body. And so whatever happens to this physical body happens to me. Mm. So you can't heal trauma if you believe that. You have to see yourself from a higher perspective. You have to look at yourself through heaven's eyes and realize I am a divine, eternal being that lives forever and ever within the source. Nothing can ever change what I am. Nothing can alter what I am, even one degree. I am one with the creator, which is perfect love. And so whatever appears to happen to my body is just an experience for my growth and learning. It doesn't happen to my soul, my spirit, my divine essence. And from that perspective, we can actually start forgiving. Because again, we realize, hey, whatever you appeared to do to me, it didn't happen to what I am. And so that's masculine healing. We have to come to terms with who we really are as a divine being. But we also can't just do that. And that's where, uh, you know, in non-duality circles and some spiritual circles, healing is taught in a kind of incompleteness that we call bypassing, where, yeah, I can work on these understandings all day. I can read you know, A Course in Miracles 20 times. But if I don't actually sit with my pain and give love and compassion to that part of me that's still suffering and say, look, it is okay to be angry about that abuse. It's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to feel afraid. All emotions are welcome here. Nothing is to be rejected. It's all good. It's all perfect in its own way. When you can give compassion to your pain, That's how you actually transmute that negatively polarized energy from your energy field. You literally depolarize it by giving it love. And so the the tricky part about healing is we don't really want to sit with those shitty feelings when they arise. Sometimes we hope that a spiritual concept could just conveniently take them out of us. And the spiritual concept does a lot of good, but it's not the whole process because an analogy I'll give is the, the flooded house analogy. If your house is flooded with water, the house represents your body mm. and the water represents all the negative energy that's trapped inside of you from your traumas and your pain. So we could call masculine healing would be turning off all the faucets in the house that were accumulating the water, right? But the house is still flooded. So you got to open the windows and the doors, right? To let the water flood out. So if you just let the water flood out, but you don't turn off the faucets, then yeah, you may experience some temporary relief. But if you don't correct your wrong beliefs about yourself, you will eventually accumulate the same pain all over again and then have to heal it again, right? So you see how either way we have an imbalance where only the two together bring real healing. Oh, that was really beautiful. That was so powerfully said, Aaron. I so appreciate going into detail and I love that metaphor. And and as I'm listening and listening with my mind and my heart, the the piece that keeps coming to me is it's it oh it comes back to, as you said, it's like this simple reminder that 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 you and I, everybody listening, we are 
you know, I am that I am, I am Mm -hmm. of divine universal love force, like whole, perfect, complete my, like that is truly. And we, I know this because you and I are here. We chose human experience in this lifetime. Oh yes. So we got to honor, and this is something I, you know, it's kind of that toxic positivity piece that I know I've had to work through is it's okay. Like it is okay to have these things that I'm seeing that you're seeing that others are seeing that you're working through that, you know, to have that pain to hold, you know, I, I've also looked at it from the adult child, the, um, inner child, the higher self. There's a lot of different ways of looking at it with, yeah. as a visual person, what's helped me a lot is to just imagine the wise adult holding the the part of me that I'll just go to what, where, what time, when did this happen? Who is, who, who's speaking like six-year-old Julie, 10 year old, 18 year old. And I just put her in my heart on my lap. I, I hold her and this has taken years and it's like, I'm still working on this. Yeah. And then I call in higher self. I call in that, that all loving power with us all. And it's like, you know, but you're right because this is something, I mean, I know for me, this is where addiction and I think many, many, many of us have different addictions. Oh yeah. This is where, you know, for me, it was sugar, right? I was like, okay, I'll just go to a box or a bag of the fridge. Cause I don't want to feel this. And so, yep, yep. you know, and, and, and I just want to say the thing though, I remember in getting that shift is you don't want to be shitty to yourself. If that's what you're doing, it all comes down to, I think what we're really saying is first, you got to just you got to be aware. You got to turn on the awareness knob and say, okay, yeah, something is, is I'm, I've, I've lost my way a little and that's okay. Let's, let's, let's just, let's start with this. Um, like you said, really all things exist in relationships to start looking and seeing, but I love the divine, the masculine, the feminine and the balancing. I hadn't heard it that way. And that is so powerful. So to digress a little, I just, I relate to this. I mean, as a human being, who's like, Yes, please. Fourth density, polarized, yeah. positive. I mean, we're not perfect either. We chose human, human, yeah. at least in this plane and this lifetime right now, although there could be many others happening at the same time, but we're here. So we're going to talk about this one, yeah. um, you know, that, that um, it's to me, there's also this level of hold some grace and compassion for yourself. Like we're, we're for all sure really, I mean, and I know anyone here right now you're doing the freaking best you can so i'm just giving everyone permission like just really give yourself some grace my goodness hey beautiful you it's julie i'm just pausing for a moment because i want to share in case you don't have this yet i am going to encourage you to get your hands on my tool set to design your best life it is free here's the copy and it is pretty darn amazing if i may say so myself it is a 25 page guidebook there are seven specific practices, one for each day of the week that are going to help you really to design your best life, to work on your mindset, on your mindfulness practices, designing your day very specifically. I'll show you here. I have a gorgeous tracking system that is all about how you align your values with how you're spending your time. And there's so much more. There's also a little extra free gift in there. I won't tell you what it is, but Definitely make sure you get this for you, for your friends, whomever. It is free. Just go to julieriesler.com slash toolset to get your copy. And would love to hear what is your favorite tool out of the seven? Which one did you resonate most with? Um, There is also an audio track in there as well. I've shared one of my quick grounding meditations. So I hope you pick it up. julieriesler.com slash toolset. It's free. It's for you. I've used these tools with hundreds of clients and my coaching students, and I use them with myself. So I hope they help you to be your USU. All right, back to the show. Yeah, a hundred percent. That That's actually one of those really satisfying answers that the law of one gives us, which can allow us to give ourselves some grace and, and some compassion that, hey, this third density plane of consciousness is extremely challenging it is, it is designed to give us an equal opportunity to choose light or dark, positive or negative. And so because the creator wants every being to make a totally autonomous choice between those polarities, the creator isn't like giving us two options and then being like, but you should really choose the positive. Right. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's like, choose whatever you want, my beloved. Yeah. And so it has to give us an equal proportion of positive and negative. 
otherwise, how could we really choose freely, right? So third density is, Ra actually says, third density is at least 100 times less harmonious than fourth density. <laughs> so it's like, okay, so that's good news. Number one, that um, some people say like, what if there is a hell and this plane is hell? We're already in hell. That's what this is. And I don't think that's literally true, but in a sense, it kind of is in the sense that this is the hardest plane of consciousness that we move through. And so if you could really get a handle of things here, hey, you're going to be accelerating in those higher densities. And, and that's the thing is that we can, like the Course of Miracles says, forgive the world and find heaven in its place. Mm-hmm. We can do that here. We can walk in that kingdom of heaven here if we're willing to heal our consciousness. And this is where Ra really comes alive in the Law of One when, he, when they start talking about uh, catalyst integration. Because they ask Ra, like, what's the best way to polarize positively? And Ra always goes back to this concept of catalyst integration. Catalyst is Ra's term for a life experience. And integration means learning the lesson that your life experience is teaching you. So the idea is that your own life experiences are, are already teaching you how to be more loving. And they're already pointing out all the things within you that are not loving, that need to be forgiven. And so if you start paying attention to the tests, the challenges, the karma that's showing up in your life, and you start meeting it with acceptance and with love, then Ra says you will polarize extremely fast by doing that. Because literally your your seven energy centers are fed through your life experiences. Mm -hmm. Meaning when when an experience comes, let's go back to the little girl with the ice cream cone. And I am about to take that first lick of the ice cream cone. And I see a little girl staring up at my ice cream cone. And my, my green ray heart chakra energy is activated in that moment because I have this thought of, oh, I really, I'd like to give her my ice cream more than I would like to eat it. And so I hand her the ice cream cone. My, my green ray energy is activated in that moment. I've crystallized more of the heart chakra energy, right? So every energy center is like that. When I'm, when I'm in an experience where um, I could either lie or I could tell the truth, my throat chakra is being activated if I tell the truth. If I lie, I'm creating a distortion in that chakra. So every single moment of your life is the supreme guru teaching you, right? We are, and this is the hard thing for us to grasp, is that we are already inside of the most intelligent possible mechanism that could ever exist. We call it the universe. But the universe is so incomprehensibly intelligent that we only even notice like 0.1% of its intelligence. And we think that's all that there is. And it's like, it's sort of like if you're playing with an ant or something and like the ants just trying to go around this giant object that keeps landing in front of it. The ant doesn't have the awareness of what a human being is. It doesn't know what's involved in the human being's mind. It doesn't know what wall street is, what an economy is, what medicine is. The ant's awareness is just a tiny fragment of yours, right? Well, Likewise, your awareness right now is just a tiny sliver, less than an ant of what's available in the universe. And that magnificent intelligence is actually communicating to you all the time through your life experiences. And so to resist what happens in life, to complain about it, to run away from it is a kind of act of insanity because you're number one, you're not aware that it's actually an intelligence communicating to you showing you things, providing you information. So you're not aware. And two, you're seeing this universe as an enemy, as if the thing you're born inside of would be your enemy. It's so crazy, right? But this is kind of normal human consciousness. So you see why we got to get out of this realm of consciousness if we're going to graduate to the higher densities. That is why we're having this conversation, my friend, and we'll have many more. Exactly. Indeed it is. I, I yeah, because I'm like, Oh, heck no, not on my watch. No, 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 no. We're not going to, no, this, this is data. Thank you very much. This is so past, so last year, like we're done. Yeah. <laughs> so we're last done. lifetime. So last hundreds of lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> so overdone. I am curious. I know you just getting back to the seven energy centers. I know we talked about the fourth and then I want to make sure we close the loop. I think on the fifth and then the sixth where Ra lives and the seventh. 
Yeah, I still haven't answered what a six density social memory complex it's is. Oh, good. This is why <laughs> I'm going to have you like 20 more times on this show. Yeah. I'm always like, oh my gosh, Aaron, it is just, I have to say, I'm like observing my body, which is our guidance system, right? Our feelings, our emotions. And I'm like, this is like playing in the most fun adventure park, like sandbox something. I don't know. It's, I just put three metaphors in one, but I'm like, this is like <laughs> a spiritual play date. Like this is so fun. Yeah. You And so healing and feel so aligned. And I'm just going to pause and say to everyone, you know, as you're listening, listen with your body, listen with your heart. And of course, you know, take what you like. I always feel strongly, like let your guidance guide you. If something doesn't feel right, well then, okay, that's fine. No worries. It's just listen. I, you know, listen with an open, that open heart, open mind, the masculine, yeah. And the feminine. Yeah. 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 Very good. I think that, um, this is why it's hard to talk about the law of one, cause we'll yes. try to answer one question and we just go off on all these amazing rabbit trails that are all so good, but, um, yeah, yeah to close the loop on the densities. So if you know what the throat chakra is, that's the fifth density. They call that the density of light. So the heart is the density of love, throat chakra, density of light. Light represents illumination or wisdom, knowledge, understanding. So the fifth density is where, um, first of all, the, the body of a fifth density being becomes what they call a light body. So one of the cool principles that Ra teaches is that as consciousness evolves through that color spectrum or density spectrum, the, the physical vehicle that your consciousness incarnates into has to match the frequency of that density so that you can actually channel the level of consciousness you're operating at, right? Imagine um, trying like a dog's brain or something, trying to get a dog's brain to understand everything a human being knows. It just doesn't have the bandwidth for that, right? So it's a lower density life form. So as consciousness evolves, the body consciousness is in becomes more high vibrational. And it basically moves more and more towards a light body, which is a body that's pure electromagnetic energy. So fourth density is a, co a combination or hybrid of what Ra calls the chemical body, which is the one we have right now, and the light body, which is fifth density. A fourth density, let's say like an extraterrestrial, if we could, if we could see a fourth density alien from another planet, their body would be it's like 50, 50 between chemical and, and electromagnetic. So think of like avatar, like a very bright body that almost has a glow to it, more translucent. Uh, usually Ross says taller, um, more, more frail looking, but only because consciousness has so much power that it doesn't need a big beefy muscular body with hair and stuff. That's more like animalistic type of body. It becomes more, um, crystallized, we could say. So by fifth density, the body we, we have at that level is pure light. So these beings can materialize their light in a form that looks like a human being. You know, if you listen to like Dolores Cannon's work where she does regressions with people and they encounter ETs, they'll say it's this, these beings of light that appear to them like a, a person or they could appear like anything really, because it's all based on thought They just create a body with their mind. So that's the fifth density, the light density. And then sixth density is, they call it the law of one density or the density of unity between love and light or between wisdom and love. So that's kind of the great challenge of a sixth density being is to achieve a perfect balance between love and wisdom. And Ra explains us quite a bit in the law of one that love just wants to serve. Love by itself without any wisdom uh, can sometimes make foolish decisions by being a little bit too gullible or, um, you know, for example, the negative polarity is out to trick and to deceive and to lie and cheat and steal. So a, a being that has a lot of love, but not a lot of wisdom is a perfect target for the negative polarity to manipulate. So we, if we really want to be of service in the best way, we have to endow our love with wisdom. And then we have to actually reach a perfect balance where we don't have more wisdom than we have love or vice versa. And then once our soul reaches that capacity, the next phase is that we become the higher self. So once we reach that unity of love and wisdom, basically we've gained all the polarity that we could possibly gain in the universe from incarnating into a physical body and living a lifetime. 
And now we have to do something a little more dramatic to gain more polarity. And Ra says that is becoming the higher self, where now you kind of turn back in time and you serve as a guide to all your previous incarnations from your first lifetime to your last six density lifetime. You help to bring your former lifetimes, the, the life experiences, the understandings, the lessons that will best guide it to evolve. And that's a really cool notion that you might say, well, if the higher self's already lived all of its past lives, doesn't it already know all the experiences it should give itself? And the answer is sort of, but imagine if you're watching a play on a stage and you only get to see what comes out on the stage. But when you go behind this curtain, there's a whole nother world happening back there where people are dressing up in costumes and ripping costumes off for the next scene and getting the, the props ready for the next scene. And there's all these moving parts. So you basically become the behind the curtain you who is figuring out why you needed all those experiences and why you chose those things. And um, there may even be some components to it that I'm not aware of, like maybe, maybe the source veils your memory from your past lifetimes, and you have to actually make your best educated choice of love and wisdom, how to serve yourself. But basically, that's how you polarize to the seventh density. And the seventh density, you know, the sixth correlates to the third eye chakra, the indigo ray. Seventh correlates to the crown chakra, the violet ray. And they call that the gateway density, where uh, they actually don't know much about the seventh density because they're only in sixth. Uh, but they say that we have teachers from the seventh density who help us to learn lessons and, and, and whatnot. So they do know that seventh density beings serve as guides to sixth density beings. But it's sort of like you have one foot in the creator, one foot still in the universe, and you're in this, you're beginning the process of truly merging back into the allness of the source. So that is the whole journey of the soul, all the way from earth, water, fire, air, to these magnificent light beings of seventh density that have intelligence and love and beauty that we can't even comprehend. When you understand that that's the game you're playing, all of a sudden you get this amazing motivation that I, I, I do want to play that game. I do want to be here and I do want to learn and grow because I want to be a part of this amazing dance of cooperation and self-discovery that's going on in the universe. It's so exquisite. It's, uh, you know, what, what comes to heart comes to mind. First of all, I'm laughing a little because I know that I attract a lot of overachievers. I myself tend to be one. And I'm like, this is where overachiever can be great. because It's like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, damn, I want to get to seven. <laughs> I want to get my butt to seven. A couple more seven. billion years, but yeah. Yeah, a couple more. Right. It's just, you got to laugh with yourself. I'm like laughing and like, you know, we were talking about diplomas and certifications. I'm like, what, what, where do I get like the, uh, the, the, the PhD in like fourth, fifth and sixth density? Like that's my brain is so funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. She, she's like, we want to go there. This is so beautiful. You know, it's, um, what, what's coming to heart for me. And, and I, I hope this is, you know, available for everyone listening is, First of all, there, there's no better or worse, right? It's like at first or seven, and there's a difference in consciousness and in, and, and ability to, like you said, that the, the, the fourth being the density of love. And I would have thought, oh, the density of love and then the density of light and then the density together of love and light. Like it just keeps in my, the underlying tagline is it gets better and better. It's more yeah. and more beautiful. It's more and more benevolent. It's more and more love and goodness. And that to me, that to me is really that reminder of, of, of where we really come from, who we really are is, is that, um, I'm curious. It's a little digressing because I don't remember if, I feel like Rod does get into angels or the idea. It's interesting because I, I grew up a little bit with the idea of angels, but for me, I always, uh, it helps actually to just think of it as, um, non-physical light beings of hope, of peace. It's easier to kind of think it more, um, generic, so to speak versus getting 
caught up in, did I get the right angel's name? Did I call mm -hmm. the right? It's kind of like, I don't know that it really matters if I said Raphael, right? Or Uriel, I think it's more important that I'm connecting with guidance that is of the highest realm of light. Like to me, it's like, so I'm just curious though, where do angels and non-physical realm of light, where would that fit in those seven densities? Yeah, this was something that really struck me as a former Christian, because I have had experiences with angels uh, growing up. And a lot of people have described this phenomenon of seeing orbs, orbs of light. I had some really in, incredible, profound experiences as a, as a young child with orbs of light, um, whether it was in church services or uh, one time it was in my grandparents' basement in Kansas with my mom and sister where my, my grandma was dying of cancer and we were doing like spiritual intercession in the basement at night and praying for her and all this stuff. And we created such a charge in that atmosphere that we saw an orb of light, you know, float through the room right before our eyes. And then it was, it was really crazy because my mom and my sister's hair was lit up with light. Like I was seeing these flashes of light through their hair for like an hour and they were seeing it in each other's hair too. And, and Ra calls hair the antenna-like material in one session. And I was like, oh, antenna, it's, it conducts light and energy. Okay. But um, to answer your question, we, we, through this understanding of the densities and how consciousness progresses, we understand now that angels are just other beings in the universe, but there are higher density beings. So in the Bible, for example, it always describes angels as an angel of light, an angel of light, a being of light. It's shown brighter than the sun. Well, that is exactly how a fifth density or sixth density being would appear to us. It'd be like, we'd maybe see a body, but so much light. Like we can't imagine the frequency and charge these beings are producing. They actually have to step down their charge just to interact with us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, channelers have to raise their frequency through a trance state like Bashar or whatever, while the being they're channeling has to drop down their frequency so we can meet somewhere in the middle um, the David Hawkins scale would be the best representation of this in that he showed that consciousness evolves in a logarithmic fashion, which is sort of the same thing as exponential. Um, I think I'm getting this right, but it's something like if I have a space this long and then I cut it in half and then I cut it in half and then cut it in half, that'd be like a logarithmic scale where, or if you do the opposite, it gets twice as big every time. Consciousness does that as it evolves. So every, every density is to the power of, to the power of the previous one. So it's not like, oh, fourth density has um, twice as much power as third density. It's like, it's like five to 10 times more. Mm, and, then, interest. and then, interest. <laughs> yeah, compound. That's a good way of saying it. Uh, fifth density has 50 times the amount. Sixth density has 150 times the amount. So the electromagnetic frequency spectrum is mind blowing when you see it from that, that point of view, but essentially yeah, angels are just fifth, sixth density beings that are coming down to be of service in whatever way they're doing. And we thinking we're separate, just classify them as these special celestial beings that are part of God. And they come down to earth to interact with us. No, they're literally, they were once human beings, just like you. Mm. And that's where you're headed, right? That's right. <laughs> Not yet, but yes, <laughs> exactly. No, I mean, seriously, I, I love what you just said. It's interesting. I had this realization, maybe it was about six months ago, like, hold on, wait a minute for all. It's why when I was listening, I'm like, I must talk to Aaron. I have so many questions. Um, if we're all literally, literally of this one, then these angels and light beings are also like, I'm it, it, they're just in a different realm. Just yep. like, I love my cat so much. She cannot understand me no matter how many times I tell her I love her. She doesn't know what I'm saying. She feels me, but she doesn't, you know, like my husband, and I joke, we're like, we love you. We do like cute things. And she's, she's like, sort of like probably funny cute things in front of her face. And I had to realize just like my cute kitty who can't, but, but we're still connected. It's like, oh, these light beings, these angels, they're, I, 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 they're, we're part of the same fabric, the same, yeah. really it shifted my relationship because, and I thought about this a lot, having the, the, the free will, the, the ability to, you know, it's up to me to invite that in. It's up to me to, to choose, to connect, connect and communicate. 
Yeah. Um, I have had things happen where I felt that presence yet. It just, it, it didn't feel so distant. It's in, in something I've been practicing Aaron, and this has helped. And this is actually after our last conversation is when I wake up, I actually try to just before I do anything is just literally feel and, and remind myself, oh yeah, this is a beautiful, benevolent, humong like I can't my my sweet brain will never <laughs> understand so I'm gonna like yeah. let her just take a nap and call in the all-loving light force God force and just remember that lives within my cells within my being that's that that I'm an expression we're expression and it has helped so much especially these past few years with a lot of fear to be honest with mm -hmm. you know the pandemic all kinds of things happening and you know um this to me that the reason I believe this is so important what we're talking about is I don't know if I have the most poignant way to say this, but I feel like fear is probably one of the cheapest marketing tools that that has been used to take us out of our remembrance of who we are. And um, I just bought a sweatshirt. I saw some big dude at the gym was wearing like faith over fear. And I was like, I'm buying that same sweatshirt. I asked him, he's like, here's where I got it. I'm like, I'm getting one. I just for myself need the reminder uh, every single day. I'm in Mecca word every day, but to remind myself of that. And it's yeah. just when that fear comes up to remind yourself that is it's okay and not abandon yourself. And this all loving source it doesn't even exist in the divine. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't exist in the divine. And that's how we can begin to integrate it is to see, see the illusion for what it is. And this is where the polarities help us again, because if God mm -hmm. is love, perfect unity, perfect harmony, absolute wholeness, then if God's going to create a universe where it can discover itself, know itself, experience itself, then it does that firstly through those two polarities, positive and negative. So the only options God has to create polarity out of is that one of those polarities has to represent all the creator is and the true nature of the creator. One polarity has to represent that. And the other polarity has to then represent the exact opposite of what the creator is. So Ra actually calls the negative polarity, the path of that, which is not it's based on the illusion of separation ultimately. And interesting fact for the listeners is that Ra also says that the negative polarity can't progress past early sixth density because it, the negative path will eventually run into this predicament or paradox where remember how we said that once the sixth density soul gains a perfect balance of love and wisdom, then it, it has gained all the polarity it possibly can from the universe. It's served in every conceivable way. It's done every act of service there is. Now it has to do something more dramatic to polarize, and that's to become the higher self. Well, a negative being will also come to that point where they can't gain any more negative polarity from the universe They've performed every act of enslavement and domination they could possibly ever experience in the universe. So now what? Well, they got to become the higher self. And Ra says, to our knowledge, there are no negatively polarized higher selves in the universe. All higher selves are positively polarized. Why is that? That's because you have to serve your previous lifetimes, right? Mm -hmm. So a negative being can't act as a guide to its past lifetimes without polarizing positively. You're serving something else other than yourself. The, the negative higher self would want to dominate and control its previous lifetimes, but it can't do that because it is itself, right? So it's, it's in this paradox where it's like, oh shit, how am I going to get out of this? I can't serve myself or I'll polarize positively, but I also can't polarize more negatively because I've already done that. So Ra says, this is where the negative sixth density being will eventually concede to the path of light and say, okay, the positive polarity is the truth and it will reverse its polarity to service to others and realize that the highest truth of the universe is oneness, not separation. Now, a negatively polarized being of sixth density knows that, but they're too busy enjoying their domination and enslavement. And if you're familiar with solipsism, if, if the listeners are familiar with solipsism, 
it's a kind of like non-duality variation that essentially says you are the only real thing that exists. Everything else out there is just a play of your mind. It's not really there at all. So it doesn't really matter what you do to anything. And in fact, the more that you learn how to control your mind externally, the more powerful you become. That's essentially solipsism, right? So we could say that the negatively the negative polarities philosophy of the universe is solipsism. It also acknowledges, yeah, all is one. There's only one being in the universe. That's true. But I'm that being and everything else is just my dream. So the more that I conquer my dream, the more godlike I'll become in this dream. That's how a negative being is perceiving it. So at a certain point, they're not even hating the, the beings they're enslaving or something. They're just like, no, you don't even exist to me. You're just a pawn on my chessboard. You're nothing. And so they have to eventually realize, no, everything that exists is the creator, is the one being equally. And that's the highest truth of the universe, right? Mm. This is great news that the higher self of every being is, is positively polarized. Like I just, I, I, I intuited that, but hearing you, I was like, oh, that is, that's fascinating. It is good news. It's real. I'm like, that's damn good news. You know what? Yeah. That's, that's what I've been betting on. I've been betting on what you just said. Yes. <laughs> um, before we wrap this conversation, cause I've got to tell you something. I'm already like, all right, Aaron, when are you available in a couple months to, yeah, <laughs> we'll have to come back <laughs> so for sure. Down for the role. I do want to ask one thing I did not ask you, which it hopefully <laughs> he raw or he they i should say they, yeah yeah it's a dump. i don't think it's a he it's oh, i still haven't answered that question <laughs> no 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 no. it's okay this is the sixth density social memory complex but they do talk about this confederation and i did want to just ask if there's a way to touch upon what does that mean because yeah yeah, yeah. Talk about and i know that's a whole maybe we'll just do a little bit and then next yeah yeah we'll go more into that but i was like oh let's interesting the confederation that's kind of a and i'm going to invite people to just listen again with open mind open heart take what you like if it's feeling a little like it's not there for you that's cool you can let it go it's i just this um was fascinating to me and felt like oh this is this is we are part of something way beyond planet oh Earth. yes thank you very much yeah which is great yeah, and this is a good question too, Julie, because I have to answer what a social memory complex is in order to answer this question. I knew that. So, just kidding. <laughs> so we're halfway there, right? We know what sixth density is, uh, but a phenomenon that is another really amazing teaching from the Law of One is this, this phenomenon that they call the social memory complex. And this is something that evolves as Consciousness evolves and becomes more psychic. It, it starts to access its psychic abilities. Um, the lower three chakras we call the primal chakras, red, orange, yellow. That's like what makes us human. That's our drive to survive, our sexuality, our personal desires, our social self. But when we get to the heart chakra and then throat and third eye, those are what we might call the spiritual chakras. Those are the chakras where we connect to the universal energies around us. And the heart chakra is our connection to all that is, because that's what love is. Uh, once we begin to activate love, love brings with it a whole host of psychic powers. And I mentioned Kundalini earlier in our talk. This is why classically, when someone has a Kundalini awakening, almost always they'll start having these psychic abilities activate. That's because again, now you've gained a charge in consciousness. You've chosen the positive polarity. So now you can do work in consciousness. You can interact with your environment in consciousness. We call that telepathy, clairvoyance, clairaudience, and so forth. So these empathic intuitive abilities wake up in us as we activate the heart chakra and we start to tune into other people's feelings and eventually their thoughts. And so imagine, Julie, if you and I are start to develop telepathy, where we can actually communicate through our minds and you can read my thoughts and I can read your thoughts. Well, at a certain point, beings will sort of make this choice where they're like, look, I don't want to hold anything back from you. I want you to know every aspect of me. And they kind of open their minds to each other. And in that sense, now I have full access to Julie's consciousness every thought, every memory, every feeling, nothing hidden. 
And that's what love does, right? Love is open wide. It has nothing, it holds nothing back. We love each other so much. We're not afraid of judging each other. Beautiful, beautiful act of love, right? Well, now you and I are kind of one being, right? right? Cause you have full access to my mind. So like if you're in San Francisco and I'm in LA and someone wants to talk to Aaron, you can literally speak for me because you know exactly what I would say in response to anything because you have full access to my mind. So that's what telepathy will eventually do for the human race. And Ra says, basically what happens over time, thousands and thousands of years. Have you seen the movie Dune? No. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Got to watch it. Really, really good. Okay. If those listening have watched Dune, um, you saw how they had these kind of psychic abilities where they could plant thoughts in each other's minds. Um, the mother can feel other people's pain. She, she knows when someone dies, she feels it. That's a great example of what it's going to start to be like in that those connections are going to increase for us. So eventually a third person joins Julie and I's social memory complex. And we have three minds being shared and that just keeps happening to where eventually an entire society, you know, in the gravity of love, love doesn't want to leave anybody out. So love is like, Hey, anyone's welcome. Come join our party. We're all one over here. Let's all be one. And eventually love will merge all minds into one great mind. Even a course in miracles says all minds are joined, right? They are joined. We are just not aware of the joining yet. So a social memory complex is a, a collection of every mind on that planet that's now acting as one mind. So every, every thought, any information, every piece of data that anyone knows is now available to the whole. So you wonder how these beings are inventing UFOs that can fly at the speed of light and gravity and, and use gravity and stuff. Well, they have an enormous advantage on their planet where imagine if every engineer on the planet could share thoughts with each other think about the technology we would create. So it's like, of course, they can develop these, these craft that do amazing things to us. We're still separate on this planet. So our technology is way slower, but you notice it's getting faster and faster, isn't it? Mm. We have the internet that connects us now. So humanity is already beginning to evolve into this social memory complex. But to get back to the Confederation, we talk about the path of service to others wants to serve in as many ways as possible. So Ra says, one of the ways that higher density beings who are at that level, all social memory complexes, um, the social memory complex begins at fourth density and then continues on through the densities. So they call it the confederation of planets because it's basically like, for example, Venus, where Ra once was, um, the planet Ra was born on and, and evolved on. Now they're a six density social memory complex. On uh, Sirius, there's another planet that's a fifth density social memory complex. All these positively polarized social memory complexes find each other and they say, hey, let's, let's form a confederation or we can help each other serve in all our solar systems. And uh, that's a greater act of service, right? Mm -hmm. So the big thing is that the confederation of planets does not want to interfere with our free will, unlike the negative polarity who does want to interfere with our free will. The positive polarizes by honoring and protecting free will. So they want to be of service to us to the extent that it's not harmful to us or detrimental in some way. And that's why we're in this weird kind of standoff with ETs on our planet right now, where it's like we, almost everyone I know has seen a UFO at this point. I've seen multiple of them. I've done multiple CE5 meditations where we've called UFOs down. Um, the, the Pentagon has admitted it. Our own government totally acknowledges like, hey, we have craft in our possession that are from other planets. So it's like, we all acknowledge other beings exist and that they're here, but we haven't fully been like, hey, let's have a friendship. Let's, you know, we're not afraid of you. Let's work together. And the ETs that are here to help us will not force a friendship on us, mm. right? When half of our population is still afraid of them, uh, intimidated by them, not sure what their motives are. So this is why we see this. Um, I call it the acclimation phase mm. where you just see UFOs just peacefully cruising through the skies and our jets are like, Oh, I'll shoot them down. And they just like disappear. They're, they're doing everything they can to show us, Hey, we're not a threat. Yeah. Like, look what our craft can do. Look at our technology. If we wanted to take you guys over, it wouldn't take long. And if we're not doing that, we must have friendly intentions, right? So how long does it take for 
planet Earth to recognize that and begin to open our hearts to these beings and welcome them onto our planet, maybe another hundred years, but we're, we're getting closer and closer every day. And that is part of what the confederation of planets is doing. Eventually, once human beings are in friendship with ETs, they will begin to slowly share technologies with us that help us and that aren't going to be weaponized for evil and stuff and slowly help us evolve out of this. And then eventually we'll join that confederation. We'll be like Earth's memory complex with all the other planets up there and we'll all help serve the universe together. So we have a beautiful destiny ahead of us, but we got to get through some of this, this healing first, right? Yeah. Wow. I... <laughs> I'm like, I don't know where we just went. I'm like, my gosh, I don't even feel like I'm here in my studio recording anymore. I'm like, where? <laughs> I feel like we're in this like other realm, which tells me this has been like, so, so, so delicious and meaningful and enriching. And, um, I, I want to ask one, one, all right, this is it. This is my last, I'm going to just <laughs> thought this is what always happens with you. Well, I, I, with the social memory complex, just to say one thing for, cause I know many, many people here, um, we've talked about, for example, Esther Hicks, who, who connects with, with Abraham. Um, I'm a huge fan. I love Abraham Hicks. Uh, to me, my, my feeling and sense is that is a social memory complex coming. Right. Through. That's why it's always we, we, this, we, that. Right. And that is a great, that is, and I know Bashar, there are others also, that yeah. are actually many. Um, we had talked about, uh, uh, what is her name? The one who's British. Oh, um, not uh, Dolores Cannon. Dolores Cannon, who's amazing. Um, yeah. Anyhow, there's another woman who channels Ananda. There's so many, but th this, mm -hmm. for those who are into Abram Hicks, this is where you can now make that connection of what you were just saying, Aaron. Because I heard, make sure you bring up Abraham because so many people, it, 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 know and, and listen yeah. to that. And that's a great, it's a great segment. Um, all right. So I will just hand it over to you. You might remember one of my terms that I like to use and ask is I always love to honor our heart, the heart. So I call them heart flares where your, your own body wisdom, your higher self, your heart is literally like, you know, Julie, I forgot to say this, or I want to just say this or whatever the heck your heart wants to share. I want to give you a moment for a heart flare. Mm. Uh, so that you have that opportunity, even though I know we'll talk again, it's not the last time <laughs> for sure. Um, any heart flares. Yeah. Well, as you said that, what, what really came through strong was just a, an encouragement for everyone listening that we are going through hard times on our planet, no doubt. And these times are very challenging for all of us, but every challenge is a catalyst for our highest good and our highest evolution and self-actualization. And this, this sort of healing period, as the law of one explains that earth itself is in this process of being magnetized to a fourth density level. Now we talk about the procession of the equinox, the 25,000 year cycle. Every time earth comes around that 25,000 year cycle, it's eligible to graduate to the next density. If 51% or more of the population has become positively polarized. And believe it or not, we apparently hit that mark on this third go around of 25,000 years. So in the 1980s, Ra was asked in the sessions, when will the planet officially become a fourth density planet? And Ra says around the 2011, 2012, which was the big Mayan calendar thing. That's what all these spiritual traditions, ancient traditions have pointed to this, that there's a huge transition coming in on planet earth where a higher density level of, of energy is activated in the planet's energy sphere. And so we're all under the influence now of a fourth density vibration, which means that all the third density stuff we're carrying has to be healed and purged. We have to forgive our darkness and allow it to point us to our light. And so there's a period of shadow work that has to go on. We are a microcosm of the macrocosm. So in the same way that in order for you to truly become a fourth density being in this lifetime, what do you have to do? You have to heal your third density karma. You have to forgive those who've hurt you. You have to forgive those, forgive yourself for hurting people, forgive everything, right? Until everything you look upon, no matter what it is, the devil himself is equally endowed with love and compassion. 
And so that's what Earth is doing. And this may take, you know, again, 100, 200 years or something. Um, there's also the, the very interesting fourth turning. Um, if some of your listeners might know the fourth turning, which is a um, social science that maps the way that human, the human race has moved through these kind of four periods. Um, it's also summarized in the phrase of <clears throat> strong men create good times. Good times create, or good men, good times create weak men, and then weak men create hard times. Hard times create strong men. It's like a, it's like a square that it just goes like this forever, right? When things get really good, we get complacent. When we get complacent, corruption arises. When corruption arises, we all start suffering. When we suffer, we start to wake up to our problems and heal them. It's the cycle we go through. So we're in this fourth turning right now where we've created really hard times for ourselves. But it only lasts, apparently, I think it's like every 20 years we go through a new turning. So it's like a biorhythm of the collective consciousness of humanity. So it's not going to be that much longer, I think, that we're in this period of time, maybe another 10 or 15 years, and things may get pretty tough. You know, we have to accept that possibility, but it's only for our highest good in the long run. And you have to know in your heart, you have to feel this in yourself. You came here for such a time as this. You could have not possibly incarnated on accident at this time. You would have never chosen the hardest time in human history unless you wanted to be here to be of service. So I say, while you're here in these hard times, why not make the best use of it, right? Why not open your heart to all creation, forgive all beings and shine your light to all creation so that they can wake up to their light. Man, if we all get serious about that, we will move through these karmic lessons so much faster and so much smoother. We have to learn to start loving each other, forgiving each other, and coming together in unity. And that starts with you and I demonstrating that love and unity, right? In our individual life. Amen. Wow. <laughs> and so it is. Aho. <laughs> Aho. Aho. Like this to me, this is, this is, this is why we have this conversation. This is the yeah. idea you know, when I say being your USU, it's really, I'm really talking about the polarity, the positive polarity of connecting yeah. to all that is, whatever you call it. It's the divinest you. The divinest, that's even better. God, that's cool. <laughs> the divinest you, exactly. Love it. That's really it. I, well, wow, did I feel that? And that to me, that is the anchor for all of us. That's the call to action. What you just said is to know, you said it, you know, and for those who watch this, or I think you pointed to your heart and I'm like, we've got to anchor that in our hearts. We've got to know that at the core so that no matter what is happening, we are literally, you, we can't not know that we have to live in a body that I yeah. am so grateful for you, Aaron, I th also want to thank like divine, intelligent, one universal mind creator, whatever you want to call it. Like that just brought us, obviously we're all part of that. And that brought us yeah. on this journey together. I, I feel like whenever you share and speak, it's, um, there is a resonance of very, of great love and light. And I, I just honor you at the, from my heart to yours. Thank you for being a huge light, getting us let's get beyond 51%. I'm like, shoot. I'm like, let's, Oh yeah. Let's get us, let's get more than 51% of the human population. I'd like to see it way higher. So thank you for being a huge part of that. It's like, if you just shoot for 51%, you may miss the mark. Yeah. If you, if you shoot for the stars, as they say, even if you miss, you might land on the moon. So let's all shoot for a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Let's like, let's aim a little. Yeah. Let's all do that. All of us, each of us has that ability. Um, Thank you. I, it, it's just, it's such a joy to talk to you. This is such a gift. Likewise. Thank, thank you. you so much, Julie. Really appreciate it. Oh, and thank you to our beloved listeners, all of you for hanging in there. You're still here. My goodness. If you are still here, give yourself a big hug, a big pat on the back. You clearly are looking to get into fourth density. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're still listening, you're still with me. And if you're not, that's okay too. Um, we, love you. <laughs> we forgive you. <laughs> we forgive you. Exactly. All right. We, we will be back with Aaron again soon. And please let me know, what are you getting right to Aaron as well? Let us know. What are you getting? What are insights? What are, what, what's coming to you? Revelations? What is the ahas? What is, what is landing in your heart? Really would love to know. And as always, thank you for being your USU, your highest self.